the 12 locked hearts. And this is a very interesting one. It's probably the most information you'll be receiving on uh, tomorrow. Um, Tuesday, why should I care? In other words, why does it matter if my heart is locked or if I'm with people whose hearts are locked? Wednesday, blind spots and strongholds. We all have them and how to deal with them. Thursday is pressure, rejection, and spiritual abuse. This is something that uh, a lot of people are not talking about, um, but it's very real among us and needs to be addressed. And Friday, bitterness, forgiveness, and the power of love. I hope that uh, you can be there, and um, we are praying for you. get my notes organized a little bit. Good evening, everyone. If you don't know who I am, my name is Lori Neely, and I'm the Children's Ministries Director for the Maritime Conference. This is my time to just say a lot, but I won't. How nice it is to be back at Camp Pugwash. Camp meeting is the highlight of our children's ministries every year and for our conference. This year, our team is made up of dedicated individuals who are demonstrating the love of Jesus as well uh, teaching those that Jesus loves, the children and our youth. In the divisions, uh, in the beginners, they are spending time with Noah. And this morning, I had the pleasure of this teeny tiny little tot. She could barely get up the steps. And her mother brought her, and she got out of the stroller, and she just toddled up the stairs. Bye, Mom! So whatever happened yesterday was a delight for her. She couldn't wait to get in. So that was really heartwarming. Kindergarten, they are doing a, their program based on a VBS program called Cactusville. And uh, we're having a lot of fun with that. Uh, no, sorry. I jumped the gun. Cowboy talk. Kindergarten is <laughs> exploring another VBS program by My Bible First, which is uh, another program that I have for Sabbath school in my own church, and I highly recommend it. It's called On Guard. And they're exploring the armor of God, and the idea of our mind being like a castle. So they're exploring the five senses. Do you know the five senses? What's our five senses that we learn information from? Ears, that's right, our ears, what else? Our eyes, what else? Scent or nose, what else? Taste. I got, a, I got all the kids up here. They know all the answers. What's number five? What's number five? Feel. Touch. Very good. So through that, they are learning how to protect their wonderful brain, their mind, from all that stuff that's trying to, trying to get in and trying to influence their behavior. They're, they're learning to make choices for themselves. And these are our four to six-year-olds. That's awesome. Primary, as I mentioned, is doing Cactusville. And the emphasis in a VBS, if, if you're familiar with it, are stations. So we've taken some of the stations and turned them into programs. And uh, they are having a ball over there with that. Now, juniors, our 10 to 12-year-olds, their teacher is the principal of Sandy Lake. So they are learning, this is, this is what he told me, they are learning the place and purpose of the, their purpose, oh my goodness, the place, their place and purpose in the global movement. 
you might want to go over and take a look inside. It's pretty awesome. And Stephen is the evening teacher. The morning teacher is, uh, she's doing another very, very interesting theme. My values proclaim Jesus. So again, very, very good content, very good expression, and very good teachers this year. So if you see one wandering around with their, with their tie, please tell them what a good job you're doing, because it is awesome what they're preparing. Now, I also want to thank my volunteers, because it was a hard job to find people this year. Things have changed in many ways, but they stepped up, and we also have a pastor on site, Pastor Ramon. He's the pastor from uh, PEI, so we have him on site as well. So that's another great bonus. Now, just a quick, quick run through, just a quick one. This is a time I often like to bring forward what we can do for our children. And I found an article that I'm just going to piece a little bit together. Ten ways to help children succeed spiritually. Is that not our goal? Is that not what we want for our young people and our children? Are children and young people under attack? Are they under attack? Yes, yes, in many, many different ways. Their families, the environment, their schools, so many things children are stressed and anxiety filled about. So we want them to have a spiritual life. We want them to know Jesus and know that they can turn to God. We so want that. If never before in our history, it is now we want our young people to have Jesus. It starts with taking our walking with our children side by side, not pulling them, not pushing them, but walking together, talking about spiritual things. Just like, a, a, you know, you see, you see children hold, what's more special than holding a child's hand? Do you remember the days when you hold your little toddler, you know, and they'd be dawdling along? We need to still do that with our children and stand beside our young people. Lead them that way. Make church a priority. Your family, it's part of your life. It's part of their life. But if it's only once in a while, I mean, COVID messed everything up, but we still can start again. But then the next part is the church itself. What are we doing in our churches to make our children feel welcome, make them feel loved and accepted? That's things that, as churches, we need to ponder. Even if we have one child, that child needs to know that his church family or her church family loves her or him, accepts him, and that he's special. If you have those feelings from a place, do you think you want to leave? If you have people interested in you and your life? Not, oh, Mrs. Brown's little guy, yeah, he comes to church. No, everybody's got to know little Mrs. Brown's little child, and he knows you. Walk the talk, simple as that. What we preach, we've got to live. That not as much comes out of our mouths, but what we do in our families, with our neighbors, with our church, what we do, what the children see us do, they will follow. But if we go and we volunteer for something and we come home and go, ah, never do that. What kind of impression would that make on the child? Well, mommy, daddy, they said we had to go, but they didn't like it. We want to be aware of that. Everything, everything we do, everything we look at, everything we hear needs to remind our children and ourselves of who we are serving, who is loving us. They need to know that so much. Family devotion. Now, how many people were aware of the Children's Ministries newsletter? <laughs> well, Miss Catherine, because she was a contributor. Did anyone, oh, oh, and Miss Erna, Auntie Erna is here. She was a contributor. You mean the only contributors know about the Children's Ministries newsletter? Was it not being passed around in your churches and on your bulletin boards? 
Well, I guess we'll have to look into that. <laughs> Family devotions have, in some cases have fallen by the wayside. We need to bring that back. That is foundations for our family. We need to bring back. And, it may, and there's so many wonderful ideas and so many wonderful things that we can do. Maybe your family devotion time was like, oh, I gotta get through this. Or you remember the closeness of your family, your mother and your father and your siblings. God will richly bless and his presence is there. We need to give those, our children those opportunities. Another thing to consider, finding a mentor, finding a leader in your own church. It can be a, 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 someone that's a grandma or a grandpa that is special to the child. They make a connection, a relationship, not only with their parents or their grandparents, but there's somebody there at church that's looking out for them, that's interested in them. They can go to them. A special, special friend. That's another way we can help our children succeed spiritually. And again, we've been learning, we've been talking, the churches are considering all these things. It's relationships. Kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. care. Love, care. And as a parent, looking at your child's future. What would you want your child, what kind of a future would you want your child to, ha to have? You know academically you want them to do well in school. If they have an interest in, in uh, athletics, then you want to see them. Of course, being healthy is physical activity. But their spiritual goals also have to be in place. And as parents and grandparents and church family, we need to be thinking about that for our children that are exposed to us. What do we want them to carry with them for the rest of their lives? What do they remember about being with people who love God? Do the children know that you love God? Do they know that? That's something we need to look in the mirror in ourselves. Do these kids see this? Do they see Jesus in me? And then it's establishing the walk with God themselves. As they mature, as they grow, as they learn to read, as they ch face challenges, it, just like we, teach, we help them to walk, to run, it's the same thing spiritually. They start small, but we keep continuing and nurturing their growth. And the last one, which is a really fun and easy one, celebrate spiritual milestones. Okay? Who's had a baptism in their church in the last while? A young, maybe a young person. Nobody. How sad. When a baptism happens, don't ever forget it. Acknowledge that milestone, that memory, every year it comes around, especially if it's a young person. Do you remember two years ago you gave your heart to Jesus and you got baptized? Remind them, same as we celebrate their birthdays, remind them of their growth when they went from cradle roll to kindergarten to primary and so on. Those things are important. And the children won't know they're important unless you make them important. Okay? So that's a fun one. Have a celebration. Celebrate your children's successes. Now, that's all fun and dandy, you say, yeah? There's a scripture i like to share, and then I'll close. Then, <clears throat> then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, and if you know this, please, re please repeat it with me. Suffer little children and forbid them not to, com to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God of heaven. Now, as I've been in this role as Children's Ministries, I've had opportunity for training and one of the most uh, rewarding uh, outreaches the churches can have is Vacation Bible School. And in the Maritimes, well of course COVID changed a lot and there were some virtual and we had a mobile uh, VBS, 
but now that we're living with COVID, we can make this happen. So I would like to have Cactusville join me on the stage. They're very quiet. <laughs> I have to keep going. Cactusville, Cactusville is a bit long. Yeah. This is a kit that the conference has purchased. I really want to encourage our churches, maybe this year may not be the year to do it, but start planning for next year. Now, Cactusville, as you can see, is a, a Western-themed uh, VBS. And I just want to read you, read you what it's, basically what it's about. It says, welcome to one of the most adventure-packed, exciting towns in the southwest. Cactusville is a mining town tucked away in the desert where the sun is always shining, the skies are bright and blue, and surrounding mountains look like broken spurs. Yeehaw! It's time to sharpen your spurs, pull on those dusty western boots, and get ready for a rollicking ride through the Cactusville. But first... A bit of old Cactusville wisdom. Don't squat with your spurs on. <laughs> your children will be introduced to the imaginary town of Cactusville where they will learn that they are called by God. They are called to be unconditionally loved and accepted, whoever they are. God's calling reveals a revelation of a unique purpose. He has for each and every child your child, your grandchild, your neighbor's child. Everybody knows a child. Each day, your buckaroos and little cowpokes will learn of a special way in which they've been called to follow Jesus. They're called to be different. They're called to be faithful, called to, be, to forgive, called to serve, called to give. Just as God called each of these Bible characters, that's what they're based on. He is calling your cactus-filled buckaroos and little cowpokes that they will learn how they can accept and live out this calling in their own lives while participating in a rip-roaring Bible treasure hunting cactus-filled adventure. Now, there's just one thing I wanted you to note. We need men to be involved in these programs. We need you. Our children need male models that are interested and have fun. Okay? So, I'm going to leave it now, but I hope that you will consider what I've said tonight and that you will contact me, that you will read our newsletters, that you will support any, anything that we bring forward because we need to know that you are with this with us in this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, cowboys. And the cat and dog. Wasn't that lovely? Let's invite David Crook to come up. Are you here? Yes, he is. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all. How many of you have heard of Gospel Outreach? Let me see your hands. Oh, that's wonderful. How many of you get this little magazine? Good? Well, you can all get it because we're going to give you a clipboard where you can put down your name and your address. Please fill it out fully. And this will be sent to you each month absolutely free. Now, of course, you know that the Gospel Commission is what? What does it tell us to do? Go ye where? Into all the world. And that's, that's quite a big order, isn't it? And from the very beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, missions has been emphasized. So, in 1993, a man by the name of Frank Sanyer was over in the Philippines, and uh, he got looking at mission work. 
Now, I want, to, I want to make something clear before I go any further than this, and that is this. We're not in competition with Sabbath school offerings and all that kind of thing. The money for, that's donated for, for gospel outreach needs to be something beyond that because we do need the regular missionaries. But with our work, of course, we don't have to send any missionaries. We just send funds. So what the idea was, it was this, and this is the way it works, that the, in the, native, the indigenous people, the native people, are the ones who are chosen to do the work. A mission will uh, have someone that the pastor has said is very active in the church. Am I speaking too loud? Okay. I have hearing aid and I, and I, I can't get the, these things right. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, the idea is this, that the mission will have someone that they would like to send off to a place because all of this work is church planting. It's establishing new work. What happens is a person goes off to a, an area where there's no church. He starts making friends with the people. Probably the first year he spends a lot of time making friends. The second year he's got some Bible studies going. And by the third year he's having some baptisms and establishing a new church there. They may meet out under the trees for a while, but usually they'll take native material and they'll establish a little church. And then that will grow and grow till they can have something better. Now, our work is done in the 1040 window. How many of you know what the 1040 window is? The GC has been emphasizing that for years. It's uh, 10 degrees north of the equator to 40 degrees. So it, it takes in a very interesting part of the world's population, matter of fact, in, that, in this particular area, about 97% of the individuals there have never heard of Jesus. It's un, almost unbelievable, but it's a tremendous challenge to do that work. Now, again, with gospel outreach, our overhead is about 5%. That takes care of office materials and things like that. So about 95% of the money that's collected goes directly to fund a worker over in those different areas. For 12 years, I was going to Africa once a year. My job was to check to make sure that everything was being done right, that the funds were being spent right, that the individuals that were told were in place. And I never found any problem anywhere, everywhere I went. And the thrilling stories from these places. Many of our workers are actually working in, in refugee camps because with all the trouble in South Sudan, the people had to go to refugee camps in northern, northern Uganda. And so these refugee camps, they're not just a little camp. It goes on for kilometer after kilometer after kilometer. And our workers, many of them had to flee, and so they're in refugee camps too, but they're not just sitting there in a refugee camp. They're winning souls. They have established some tremendous churches. One, one individual baptized 500 people in one year. He would gather them together in groups because they're in refugee camps and they don't have to be doing anything else. They'd like to be, but they can't. And so he would gather a group together and give Bible studies. And one time when I was there, they were, they were hoping to have baptism, but they couldn't have any. And the reason they couldn't have any was it was a dry season and everything was dried up and they were waiting for water to get in the rivers so they could have baptisms. Uh, anyway, uh, Gospel Outreach Canada, it, this began in the United States and then we were invited to join. But we, we were incorporated so that we give our own uh, income tax, uh, the receipts for income tax, all that kind of thing is done right here in Canada. And we, at the present time, Canada has 260 Canadian Bible workers. And, and would you know that uh, the last year, they had a tremen tremendous success in, in, in baptisms. Matter of fact, they baptized 3,703 people. Now, some of those areas are not easy to work. It's very, very difficult. And for someone to leave one of the churches and be from, from Ethiopian Orthodox or Muslim, it's not a very easy thing. They go through persecution, but people are so thrilled with the gospel. Also, the native religions, 
the heathen religions, it's a religion of fear. They're constantly trying to appease the, the spirits. And the witch doctor will take everything they have. They'll go to the witch doctor and he will say, well, I'll do such and such, but you have to give me so many cows, you have to give me so many goats, so many sheep. And finally, these people come to absolute poverty where they have absolutely practically nothing. And so anyway, when they hear about Jesus and the gospel, salvation costs how much? How many cows? No, it's a free gift. And to know about Jesus and his love and all this kind of thing is such a thrilling thing for them. So what a, what a, what a blessing that is and how wonderful that uh, we're able to do that. Uh, also, in this material, we... The States is very kind and, and, and prints all of this material for us. So some of these amounts of money are not quite right. One place here, there's a program we have where you can adopt a worker, where you pay so much each month. It says 150 US here, but you know that if you've been to the States, your Canadian dollar isn't worth as much as the US dollar. So anyway, it's $195 a month if you want to adopt a worker. However, Whatever amount you want to send, $10, $50, whatever it is, it's, it's all welcome. I have not put any envelopes in here because we try to be very careful about our spending, but we have envelopes. And if you've seen the booth over here, come over there and we'll be glad to give you an envelope. Also, I may have a little gift for you too. I know that we're running overtime here and so I hope that that explains about gospel outreach and if Someone has a clipboard back there to hand to each row here. If you, you just pass it along and pass it to the next person on down the row. And if you, want, if you want to get Adventures in Mission and hear some of the thrilling stories that's there, here it is. And we'll be happy to send it to you. And by the way, drop over and have a little visit with us at the, at the booth. I'll be there after each meal and maybe part of the time during the meal also. So the clipboards are coming right now to pass out at the, at the front here to each person, and then just send them on back, okay? Thank you so much, God bless you, and uh, also pray for gospel outreach. Pray for our workers. Some have been put in prison, persecuted in many different ways. It's, it, it can be very dangerous, okay? God bless you, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're ready to sing. Has it been a hot day? Oh, everyone's fanning. All the more reason why we need to sing. Are you ready to turn to Marching to Zion and get into the spirit? Hymn number 422, Marching to Zion. Oh, I, oh, that would be, sure, stand on up, start marching. I just think you'll be sweating just a bit. <laughs> How many of you are looking forward to going to heaven? Hmm. Marching to Zion. Oh, what a joy that will be. Everyone together. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne and thus around the throne. Everyone, we're marching to Zion. You Those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King. May 
may speak their joys abroad may speak their joys abroad where marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upward to zion that beautiful city of god the hill of zion yields a thousand sacred sweets before we reach the heavenly fields before we reach the heavenly fields or oh, walk the golden streets or oh, walk the golden streets we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful Then let our songs up proud and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fair. We're worlds on high to fair. We're worlds on high. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, that beautiful city of God. How many of you are looking forward to that? Amen. Our next one is Father Lead Me Day by Day. Oh, come let us sing. Oh, that, yes, over yonder. Over yonder. And that is hymn number 431, Over Yonder. <clears throat> Another one about heaven. I guess I'm excited. <laughs> I wonder if it'll be hot like it is. No way. Eh? I don't think so. <laughs> it'll be perfect. Just perfect. Not too hot, not too cold. <laughs> Come, let us sing of homeland down by the crystal sea. Wonderful land where Jesus built a mansion for me. Over yonder, down by the crystal sea.
Shall we all stand for our theme song, Love Lifted Me? I want to thank my sweet friend for praying for my voice this morning. Thank you. <laughs> deep in sin far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me now say For singing with me, you may be seated. I would say a warm welcome, but I would rather it be cool, right? I'd, I'd like to say a cool welcome to you all. Um, I just have a couple of announcements to make. This is a vehicle tag, and we're hoping that each of you know what it is and have it in your vehicle. And if you don't, please come see me in the office, okay? It is for safety um, and for us to be able to find you. So vehicle tags on all vehicles. I have one other announcement. Uh, the camp staff are doing a phenomenal job picking up our slop buckets, right? They, they come diligently. And they just want a, a, a friendly reminder that only compostables go in there um, to try to keep your garbage in the clear bags um, and not mix the two, please. OK? And if they're trying to find that this doesn't work, maybe they'll leave you a quick note. Um, share that with your friends. So thank you very much. Um, welcome, and I just want to go over the order of service. Uh, thank you, Tara, Liz, and team for a beautiful song service. We're going to have special music um, by Jose and Natalie. Uh, Mr. Dan Kelly will be having our scripture reading, followed by Mrs. Cheryl Hamilton, who will do a prayer for us. And then we get to hear Pam's beautiful voice in special music before we finally hear uh, Pastor Mike Tucker. So I'm so excited for this evening program. I hope that you will be blessed. I know that you will um, in Jesus' name. As we think about all the things that are around us and all the things that um, can distract us and we think about the bills to be paid and the things that we need and we want, I hope the first thing on our list is Jesus. Give me Jesus.
my cry. Dark midnight was my cry. Dark midnight was my cry. Give me Good evening. <clears throat> if everyone wants to turn their Bibles to John 9, verse 35, we'll read this nice portion of Scripture. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man answered, Tell me who he is, sir, so I can believe in him. And Jesus said to him, You have already seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you now. I believe, Lord, the man said, and knelt down before Jesus. May God bless this portion of scripture. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this blessed day, and thank you so much that we've had so much fun experiences with meeting up and greeting and visiting with old friends and new friends and enjoying your creation and enjoying laughter with the children and the sunshine and the water and Lord now I pray that you will draw real close to us Lord I pray that we will be able to focus send your holy spirit so that we can truly worship you as we listen to the program the speaker this evening so thank you lord in jesus name amen
can be so good Life can be so hard Never knowing what each day Will bring to where you are Sometimes I forget And sometimes I can't see Before I speak tonight, let me, uh, let me say something. This is a s small conference. I've done over 80 camp meetings in my career. That's a lot of camp meetings, especially for a guy who grew up not liking camp meetings. Uh, we got offering up here. Th are you supposed to be taking the offering? Why don't you guys go ahead and pass the buckets? I'll talk for a while. <laughs> All right, go ahead and pass those buckets. Lord, bless the offering. We're good. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and pass them now. I don't know what this offering's for, but give a lot. 
<laughs> I've done over 80 camp meetings in my career. Um, and a couple of things about this camp meeting are significant. First of all, this is a small conference and you have a fantastic facility. I, I know much larger conferences that would kill to have a facility like this. And uh, so God has blessed you beyond measure. I don't know of any other camp that's on the ocean that's got a beachfront. I don't, I don't know of any other camp that's got that. I, I, I've never seen one. And I've done a lot of these camp meetings, let me tell you. I've done them in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Sweden. I've done all over the United States and Canada. I've never seen anything like this. So God, God has blessed you. I've, uh, we have some beautiful camps with majestic uh, mountains and, and, and beautiful trees and all that sort of thing. I don't know of any on a beach like this one, the oceanfront. So that's incredible. So um, God has blessed you immeasurably. But the other thing is you have three officers that are just your president, your treasurer, your executive secretary. They're working their heads off because they want this to be so special. They, they are so happy to have camp meeting back and they are working hard, and these are good people. So, uh, so you are doubly blessed because you've got great leadership, you've got a wonderful camp, and, uh, and no one paid me to say any of this. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to say that uh, for you. Uh, God has blessed you, and I, I pray his continued blessings on, on their leadership with you and what God has for you to do in this area. Now, I want you to take your Bible, if you would, please, uh, whether it be a paper version or electronic version, uh, whatever it is, and turn to John's Gospel, the ninth chapter. We read a section of this, this story that we have here um, today for our scripture reading. And Jesus is coming into town with his disciples, and he's coming into Jerusalem. And so we have this starting with verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Now, that was a common teaching that, that uh, sickness came from sin. And so sometimes people were rejected from uh, worship in the temple or in the, uh, the synagogue simply because um, a deformity or a sickness indicated there must be sin in the family. Uh, to some degree, I still see this going on today, to tell you the truth. Uh, bad things happen and we think that it's God's punishing uh, America or Canada or somebody for what's going on. Uh, you're stricken with cancer. There must be sin in your life. That's the old story of Job. Remember that? And, and basically his three friends were worthless friends because of, that's what they said to him. I did a funeral for a nine-year-old girl and when I was away from the parents getting ready to, to go on, a woman, a a dear saintly woman came to this man whose daughter had just died of leukemia and said, God did not heal your daughter because you didn't have enough faith. And she is fortunate that I was not standing there at the time because I would be in jail for murder. Um, I, obviously, that's an exaggeration, but um, I was just livid when I found out. And they wouldn't point her out to me because I was, I was going to go talk to her. And it was probably best that I didn't because of the mood I was in at the time. But that comes from the belief that there's a direct relationship with personal sin and affliction. And we are afflicted because we live on a really stinking planet. This is the result of sin as a, as a planet, not you, not me personally. It has to do with the fact of where we live. And sometimes the question is, why do bad things happen to good people. It happens because we live in a really bad neighborhood. That's what happens when you live here. And I think that when we get to heaven, if we ask God, why did this happen? He might say, are you kidding me? Do you have any idea how many things I protected you from? Do you have any idea where you were living? It was awful. That's what sin does. And so I, their question was, was foolish in that respect because it was based on faulty theology. And Jesus, he, I imagine his heart was breaking over this, wanting to, to address it and correct it, but here's what he does. Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. So he said, the, the, the theology you have is wrong. Just, just mark that one off the books. He didn't go on to explain why. Um, although the answer why, if you want to know the truth, is best explained in the concept of the great controversy. When you get down to, to big picture, why does this happen? 
our understanding of the great controversy, the conflict between Christ and Satan, uh, with the meta narrative of Scripture, is the best way to explain it. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. Jesus answered, It is neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so healing that a bad thing has happened to this man is displayed the works of God. Uh, we're going to heal him, and I want you to see this. And even though Satan has done his worst, God's going to do his best. And, and when that happens, God will be glorified. Verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. You hear Jesus' passion. I've only got a short time. I've got to work with the time I have. I, I, there's so much to be done. And while I'm here, I'm the light of the world. There's one of those great I am statements from the Gospel of John. I am the light. I am the truth. I am the way. I'm the door. Um, I am, so he is the light of the world. He says, I'm, I have this tremendous amount of work to do as long as I'm here. My time is running short. I know that I won't be here long. So as long as it's day, I'm going to work. But that is also a prophetic message for us. As long as it's day, we've got a work to do. Uh, he is the light. He shines in us, and we are to let that sh light shine out of us. Verse 6, when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made a clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which translated is, is uh, sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Now, people wonder why Jesus did this. You know, he could just say, eyes be opened, because he could speak things and make it happen. But the man is blind, and maybe it's difficult for Jesus to communicate with him what he, he wants to do for him. So it was believed commonly in that day that there were healing properties in saliva. And so Jesus spat on the ground and made a poultice, basically out of his saliva and the dirt, and applied that to the eyes. And so now that he maybe hears him spitting, and he realizes something has been created, and he puts it on his eyes, he realized that Jesus is now in the process of healing him. He doesn't know who he is, really. Uh, maybe he's got his name because he's heard that. But he goes and washes. He just does what he's been told to do. And suddenly this man, who has never seen before in his life, can see. He can see. I've, I've spoken to eye doctors who talked about eye transplants that they can do now for blind people. And it, but it's more than the eye transplant because now that part of the brain that receives the messages has to be awakened. And so there's a, the, sometimes you have to train the brain to actually interpret what, what is coming into it, the information coming into it through these eyes now. And that can be as hard as actually the eye transplant. But all of that was taking place with Jesus healing this man from blindness. He didn't just heal the eyes themselves, but he communicated with the brain. He healed the, that portion of the brain that receives the messages and translates it into sight. All of that took place in an instant because of what Jesus did. There was nothing magical about the spittle and the clay. I, there are two reasons why he did this. I think first to communicate with the, the blind man, but the second reason we're going to come across in just a moment. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see that in just a second. I'll come back to that. Um, so he said, go wash in the world pool of Siloam, and he went and washed. Verse 8, therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is this not the one who used to sit and beg? And others were saying, this is he. Still others said, no, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the one. So you get the picture? Nobody's talking to him, and no one's listening to him. Is this the guy? They're talking about him. He's right there over him, as though he's not there. Is this the guy? No, that's not the guy. Yeah, I think that's the guy. It's me, guys. Yeah, I'm the guy. No one cares. No one's listening to him. They're ignoring him. And, and people do this a lot with people with, uh, with infirmities and handicaps. I've seen them do it with senior citizens in nursing homes. I've seen them do it with patients in hospitals. They talk over them as though they're not even there. Um, and with people with any sort of infirmity or handicap, again, it is done that way as well. And um, it went, you, know, you know you're starting to get old when your children do it, when you're in the room. That's, that's just wrong. Um, it, it happens, and Jesus recognizes that, and, and we'll see later that Jesus actually talks to the man. But he goes on with this. I am him. 
I, he kept saying, I'm the one. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes open? He answered, the man who was called Jesus, so he does know his name, but remember, he's never seen him, made clay, so he knows what he made clay. He heard him doing it. He recognized he made this poultice and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. I've never seen him. <laughs> I don't know where he is. I know where I was when it happened, but I don't know where he is. I've never seen him. So uh, again, this is an amazing thing, and people are stupefied by this. So they have to get clarity. Someone thinks that we need to report this to someone, and so they choose the Pharisees. We'll come to this in just a moment. Verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly bl blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when the Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. This is the second reason why he made clay. The first reason was to communicate with the man, I'm, I'm going to heal you. And so he put the poultice on him. But the second reason is this. Jesus knew that according to the Sabbath laws that the Pharisees and the, the rabbis and all that had, had, had constructed that were contained in what is now called the Mishnah, there are 200 and over 250 Sabbath laws that are contained in, uh, for the Jews that they tried to keep. And uh, among those laws are if a tailor is working on a Friday and he finishes his work and, and just happens to put the sewing needle in his lapel and he goes home Friday night and Sabbath morning he walks to, um, to synagogue or temple with that needle still in his lapel because he forgot it, he has just broken the Sabbath because he's carried a burden. It gets that detailed. Also, among those laws are these. You could not heal someone on the Sabbath take steps to heal, you could, you could save a life so that they just didn't like bleed out or whatever. Just keep them alive, but don't try healing measures until the Sabbath is over, such as making and applying a poultice. Jesus, I think, did it on purpose just to tick them off. <laughs> I think he did it just to stir up the controversy because that would bring attention to what he's doing and also give him an opportunity to confront them with the silliness of their Sabbath laws. He's the one who made the Sabbath. Don't you think he knows how to keep it? He made the Sabbath. And by the way, healing a blind man, a man blind from birth, isn't that glorious thing to do on the Sabbath? What a wonderful thing. And yet they're upset because he made a poultice. He applied the poultice. This is healing and the man can see. You should have waited until after the sun went down. I'm, I, I, you know, I, I'm stupefied by that and yet I'm not. I grew up in the 1950s in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Texas. And we had Sabbath laws. We didn't have 250 of them, but we had a number of them. On the Sabbath... You could go wading, but you could not go swimming. And you could wade up to the, if you were a conservative Adventist, it would be the bottom of the knee. And if you were a liberal, you'd go over the knee because you were pressing it, you know. Um, a, a boy could run on the Sabbath, but if you introduced a ball to the activity, he was suddenly violating the Sabbath. Anybody have similar Sabbath rules that you grew up with? All right, I see nodding of heads. and Yeah, did any of you... Enforce some of those Sabbath rules because, you know, I raise kids too. Uh, the, the truth is that that misses the point of the Sabbath. It misses the celebration. It misses the joy. It miss, misses the, the beauty of the Sabbath, the, the silliness. And they had so many silly rules and regulations and laws that it, it just was a burden. And no one could remember them all and no one could keep them all. There was a certain number of steps you could take for a Sabbath day's journey. That's all. Then you had to stop, no matter where you were. You had to stop. So knowing this, they would take that same journey on Friday. And they would take a Sabbath day's journey, and then they could hide food and water. Because if you, if you stopped, basically the day's over. If you take food and water and rest, then you can take another Sabbath day journey. So they hide food and water at different points along the journey. They stop. Oh, okay. Now I take, take another Sabbath day. I mean, seriously, the ways they would get around these laws is silly. The law itself was silly. And yet they spent a lot of time and energy doing this because they thought that that's what would please God. So Jesus did this on the Sabbath day 
Um, and I think that that's, he did it on purpose, to tell you the truth. So, at verse 15. Then the Pharisees also were asking him how he had received his sight. And let's stop here before I go on with the rest of verse 15. The, there were three basic classes of religious people in, uh, in Palestine at this time. The Sadducees. That was primarily the priestly class. There were others involved with this. And they had been viewed by some as being a little bit too liberal, although they kept all these laws, by the way. So I don't know how that's a liberal. But uh, one thing is their theology was a little different. Uh, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, which is why they were so sad, you see. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's a dad joke, but, you know, <laughs> you can't get past it. Uh, that's why they, they didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees were, this was more of a grassroots movement because they thought that maybe the Sadducees and the priests were not solid enough in their keeping of the law. And these, their desire was to be holy because they were sure that it was, it, they had not kept the Sabbath properly and they were engaged in idolatry. It's why Israel had gone into captivity and they were going to restore the glory of Israel by making sure that they never again violated the Sabbath. Or, or idolatry, or any of the, the laws, they were going to make sure that Israel kept them. And so that was their study, their life. In order to keep all those things, you had, a be, you had to be wealthy and have a lot of leisure time because it was just a lot to do and to keep up with. But they, that was a class of people. Now, they were more popular among the people than were the priestly class or the, uh, the Sadducees even though they were pretty harsh and tough guys and really conservative. Then you had the scribes who used to be just professional copyists, but by this time they were actually more along the lines of lawyers. They were scholars who understood uh, the, the laws and the Mishnah, all the, the additional rules, and some of them were a part of the Sanhedrin, which was the Supreme Court of Israel. So those were the three major groups. But when a, an issue of this nature came up, the common people would usually go first to a Sadducee. They'd go to the Sadducees first to ask for a ruling on this. So that's what they're doing here. So verse 15 again, then the Pharisees who were also, pardon me, I said Sadducees, they would go to the Pharisees because to, to get the ruling on it. So then the Pharisees were also asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes, and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. So what did he do on the Sabbath to break it? He healed a man. <laughs> but he created a poultice and he applied it. He applied healing poultice, apparently, because the man can now see. So they're saying he doesn't keep the Sabbath which is, again, a false assumption. Uh, what he didn't keep and what he didn't bother with was their little Sabbath rules. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So some of the Sadducees actually said, how can he do this if he's a sinner? It doesn't make sense to us. However, as we go on, we see that that number was in the minority. And the strongest, the loudest, and the most popular voices were those that were against Jesus. They'd already decided that this man was a threat to their way of life. And already his believers were being persecuted. And we'll find that out later. Verse 17. So they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. Well, there's an understatement, but still, what, it's a logical conclusion for him. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe it of him, that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight. So if you can't explain the miracle, let's try to explain it away. Maybe it wasn't really a miracle. We'll get some evidence that maybe to the contrary, so we don't have to deal with the reality of this miracle. Maybe it wasn't a miracle. And questioned them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but as to how he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. They threw the kid under the bus. They distanced themselves from him. They were frightened of the Pharisees. They were frightened of the, of the leaders, the religious leaders, because they had already heard, and we'll find out the next verse, they already heard that they were putting people out of the synagogue, not letting them go worship. And the synagogue was more than just worship. This was the center of commerce. It was the center of society. It was a center where they actually pooled the resources to do good things for the poor. 
So it was more than just a, a, a worship and a teaching center. This was the center of Jewish life. You had to be a part of the synagogue. That was a, to be away from that means you're being excluded from Judaism and from your culture and from your community. So they did not want that to happen. They didn't want it to happen. Um, so verse 22, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. We're going to exclude you. We're going to excommunicate you, so to speak. We're going to put you out of religious life, and which may affect your business. It certainly will affect the, your, your friendships and your culture. Uh, you'll be excluded from worship. You'll be excluded from all the, the things that make you a Jew. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So, all right, they didn't get what they wanted from the parents. They're going to go back to the kid. Go back to the young man, and they're going to ask him again. But they're going to hint as to what the answer should be here. So a second time they called the man who had been born blind and said, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. So tell us the truth. We know he's a sinner. Just fess up here. Maybe this was a partial healing. Maybe, maybe any number of things. And he answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I See, that, that is the most beautiful statement. By the way, if you want to be a witness, I know that some people are frightened about witnessing because they think, I, I don't know it well enough to give Bible studies on this stuff. That's not what a witness is, and that's what, not what Jesus has called you to do. What he's called you to do is this. Give the testimony that the blind man did. All I know is I was once blind, but now I see. I was living in darkness, now I'm living in light. I had no purpose, and I was living with guilt and shame, with a life without direction. Now I live with the freedom of guilt. I live with joy. I live with purpose. I live with hope because Jesus is coming, and I'm going to go home with him. That's it. If we lived that way, if we, if we treated each other that way, that would be the witness that we need. Uh, Elder White at one point said if, if we would just deal with people with, with kindness and love and, and courtesy and gentleness. We'd have a thousand converts where now we only have one. But a, a lot of us are, there are some people witnessing who I wish wouldn't, frankly, because they want to convince people about the Pope, the state of the dead, and the Sabbath in such a way that it's just ugly. It's just ugly. Instead of loving on people, they want to say, you're wrong, I'm right, and let me prove it to you. That's a, not a good way to win friends and influence people. But trying to get that across, though, I'm just speaking the clear word. No, you're just being mean. You're just being nasty. Stop it. Don't, don't, uh, uh, don't associate yourself with us because that's not the way of Jesus. Watch how he treated people. Watch how he dealt with them. That's a better way. Learn to love first. Being right is overrated. Being loving is underrated. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's an excuse to be wrong. I'm just saying that the emphasis is first got to be on being loving. And even when you're right, if you can present it in a loving fashion, that would be an extra bonus. Because that's the way of Jesus. That's the way of Jesus. Verse 26. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? I love it. This guy's a smart aleck. That's all there is to it. He has just poking the bear. He said, you know, I've never, been, I've never been in anyway. I know you're threatening to get people out because if they confess him to be the Christ. I've been out all my life because I was blind. You said that this was a result of sin. I've never been in anything. You can't kick me out when I've never been in. I've never liked you anyway because you always said that this was because of my sin or my parents' sin or my grandparents' sin. Or how, how did I sin? In utero? I don't, I don't understand this. How did this happen to me? And yet, you, I've never been in. So you're going to kick me out? Knock yourself out. He's poking the bear and he's having fun with it because he's finally, he's been put down all of his life and he's got a chance to fight back and he's doing it. I like him. He's got a spunk. 
He's, he's a smart aleck, which tells you a lot about me, that I like smart alecks. So they reviled him, and some translations say they cursed him. So they lost they, their cool and started to curse him. They reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So it wasn't enough just to poke the bear. Now he's just going to kick him. He, he, whatever he wants to do, he's attacking the bear. Um, and, and the response he gets is, they answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and you were teaching us, so they put him out. He's never been in, but now he's out. They put him out. And I don't think he much cared. I don't think he did. Although he's, he's got to be wondering, what just happened to me? This most glorious day of my life I can see, and these guys are upset. They're upset with me. They're upset because it was done on Sabbath. And they're not willing to give God glory. They're upset about who did it and why he did it and when he did it. And how he did it. They're upset. And I just want to be happy because I can actually see now. I can see my parents' face. I can see the faces of those who have been kind to me. I can see the faces of those who weren't kind to me. I can see the birds, the sky, the buildings around me, the glories of the city. I can see the countryside. I, I can take it all in now. And yet you're upset with me. Well, put me out. That's fine. But what I like is what happens next. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had put him out. And finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, the Son of Man is a messianic term, comes from Daniel and Ezekiel is where we find it. And by this time in Jewish history, there was also, there was already some emerging theology about the Son of Man, the coming Messiah, linking that phrase with the Messiah. And so Jesus is saying, do you know who the Messiah is? The Son of Man, do you believe in him? And he answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. He said, it's me. I am the Messiah. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus heard of the man's travails. He healed him. The guy got thrown out of the synagogue anyway. Now he wants him to know, they threw you out, but God has never thrown you out of anything. God has never rejected you. God has never hated you. God has never seen you as defective or half a man. He's always seen you as his son, his child, whom he's adored. And now that you believe in me, salvation is yours. That's what he's saying to the man. He could not leave him with that state. He went to make sure that this man was made whole completely. Not just the physical healing, but spiritual healing as well. Those who should have been his spiritual mentors were tormenting him and punishing him and hurting him. But Jesus said, I'm going to complete the healing. I'm going to heal your heart as well. Verse 39, And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things, and they said to him, We are not blind too, are we? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see... Your sin remains. John does a lot of contrast between night and day, light and darkness in his stories and his whole gospel. And with the light, of course, uh, representing the things of God and salvation and truth and hope, and darkness, the things of Satan. And um, day is when good things happen. Day is when the woman at the well came to Jesus and received him and converted the entire town. Night is when Nicodemus came and did not re receive Jesus. He was, 
his mind was open, but he, he was too timid to make the decision. That happened at nighttime. Jesus was arrested at night. On and on it goes. The, the good things happen during the day. The bad things happen at night. Our light versus darkness. Sight versus blindness. Those contrasts are themes of this book over and over again. And Jesus used this as an opportunity to begin to teach the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and anyone else who would listen that sight comes from above. Sight is to open your heart and your eyes and your mind to the one who has loved you all along. That when we become myopic and we focus on a little bitty set of rules that we think will make God happy, that will somehow appease Him, we have lost the true vision of what it is to be a Christian. The other lesson in this is that we live in a bad planet. It's a planet of darkness. And because we live in a bad planet, bad things happen to good people. It just happens. I worked as a hospice chaplain for uh, a few years, and I, a woman came on our program who was, had a brain tumor, was inoperable, and she was going to die. And under her, her religion, it was listed as atheist. And yet it was my job to offer a visit to every, every patient. So I thought I would get turned down, so I called because uh, it was my job, and I explained who I was, and I offered a visit. There was a pause. You're not going to try to convert me, are you? I said, well, if you don't want me to, I, I don't know that I could convert you. Well, all right, you can come. I said, okay. So I came. So I, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to face here, but I got there, and a friend ushered me into her room, and I sat on, on the chair, and I thought we would engage in small talk to get things started, to build trust. She was having none of it. She figured she didn't have much time, so she was going right to, for the jugular. She said, so you believe in God? Said, well, yes, yes, ma'am, I do. Her name was Maggie, by the way. She said, how can you believe in a God who allows innocent children to suffer and die? You ever been asked that? Yeah. And it's a common argument against the existence of God. The problem is that the argument itself suggests that God may exist. Because you're saying that there's absolute evil in the world. Evil cannot exist without there also being absolute good. The question is, who determines what is good and what is evil? If the, if the planet really is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, if it's survival of the fittest, then it doesn't matter what happens to the weak because they're of no consequence anyway. It's only the strong who survive. So innocent children, I'm sorry if you got in the way and your mom or dad couldn't take care of you because the strong survive and we can do what we want. That's, that's basically what the survival of the fittest would be, right? And yet somehow we all seem to know that that is wrong, that it's wrong that innocent children should suffer and die, that they should be victims of war, that they should, they should be victims of cancer or any other childhood disease. We just know somehow that's wrong. Why is that? And I explained that to her. I said, that, the very question suggests the, the existence of absolute good, and the only way for that to exist is that there be a good being who decides what is right and what is wrong because the normal course of, of, of uh, evolutionary history would not bring us to that conclusion. It would not bring us there. She thought about that for a while. I said, now it's a natural question because a lot of people have asked it. Even uh, Job asked it when he was suffering, although his, his friends asked it, and they, they asked it a little different way. They said, you're suffering, therefore you must be a sinner. So you, you have done bad things, and, and so you, you know, you're identifying with that which is bad. So anyway, they're asking the same question in a different way. It said, this, it's been going on. And she said, well, how do you explain it? So I explained it from the concept of the great controversy. God created a perfect world. It was never his plan for, sinners to, uh, for, for people to be sinners, never his plan for people to be sick, never his plan for people to hurt, to suffer, to die, but to live forever in joy and peace. But an enemy came in, and corrupted what God had created that was pure and, and destroyed. And from that moment, sin entered in, and that means that the, the whole planet went to hell in a handbag, so to speak. It fell apart, and evil things happened. But that loving God would not allow us to stay where we are right now. This is a temporary mess we're in. And so he sent his son so that reconciliation with the Father would be possible, paying the penalty for sin, 
so that eventually he can come again and make right all this ugliness so that innocent children will never suffer again. When you understand it in the concept of the meta-narrative of Scripture, the great controversy, now it begins to make sense. We're in the middle of a story. And the story is bad right now, but the story will not stay bad because a loving God will not allow it to stay this way. He will eventually make things right again. All right, she began to think, well, just as soon as I got through that, she had another question. And then another one. And at first I thought she was attacking my religion and trying to make me not believe. And the more I answered questions, the more I realized that that's not what she was doing at all. She was looking for an excuse to believe. She was facing death. And that seemed so empty for her. It seemed nothing. It seemed, it seemed like her life had been a waste. If this is all there is, seriously, this is it? It just seemed empty to her. She wanted to believe that there was something more, something bigger. So my, my inner attitude toward her changed when I began to realize this. And I helped her find excuses to believe. I helped her find reasons to believe. I helped her take a leap of faith. We had conversations together until one day, eventually, she made a leap of faith. And Maggie, who had lived as an atheist, did not die as an atheist. She died as a believer. And I fully believe that I will see her resurrection morning. You see, Maggie had lived in darkness all of her life, not even recognizing that it was darkness. She had been blind all of her life and not even recognized what she was missing. But as she was facing death, she thought, surely there must be more. Surely there must be something better. Surely there's something else. And all she needed was an excuse to believe, just a little bit of information, just a logical argument that makes sense that, yes, God really could exist and he could be good and, and he could love me and he could possibly want me to live forever so that this is not all that there is. And Maggie took that leap of faith and said, I believe, I trust. The lights came on for Maggie. Her night became day just before she went to sleep. Her darkness became light. Her despair became hope. Dear ones, we serve a God who loves us like crazy. And we, we kick against him and we get frustrated we get mad, we get irritated, we get tired, we get discouraged. When you go through hard times, you think, hey, are you really there? Do you really care? I mean, seriously, uh, how, how could all this be? I, I went through some really bad times in my life, uh, and the story takes too long to tell. But I really thought there was a point where I would never preach again simply because of what was happening to my life. It wasn't what I had done, it's what happened to me. And I was depressed. The depression, the classic definition for depression is anger turned inward. I was angry at God, but I turned that anger in on myself, and that's depression. And I was depressed. I was depressed for 13 years. And finally, God miraculously reversed those circumstances I was in and suddenly opened up a wider ministry for me than I'd ever dreamed possible. And, and my depression lifted. It, it was gone. And I was glorifying God. And then I thought, all right, now why was I so angry with him? And as I reviewed my thoughts and my experience, I realized that my anger was because I thought God owed me more. I'd always preached against the gospel of prosperity. Give God $20 today, tomorrow he'll give you 100 it, It's not in there. And yet... My attitude was, Lord, look at how I've suffered for you. Look at how I've, I've worked all the long hours. Look at, at the people that have been baptized. Look at all, and all this, and, and still you send this to me? Seriously? What did you want from me, God? I, my argument was, God, you owe me better than this. And when I realized that, that my lived theology was not congruent with my preached theology, I confessed it as a sin. I asked him to forgive me, to, to remove the shackles from my eyes, to take the darkness away from me, and to march me into light, and to make my preached theology congruent with my lived theology. And I started to minister in joy. Fast forward then some 20 years, and my wife was 
was diagnosed with incurable pancreatic cancer, stage four, involvement in the liver, huge tumors. By the time we knew what was going on, it was too late. She was diagno diagnosed on March 17 and died April 10. Before that, she had no symptoms. Before March 3, she had no symptoms. But when that happened, what surprised me is the, the, although anger had always been my go-to emotion, I was not angry. I was not angry. And it dawned on me that God had answered my prayer. He had made my live theology congruent with my preach theology because instead of anger, I had a sense of gratitude for what I'd had for those 40 years. I asked my wife if she was angry. She said, she looked at me like I was from Mars. Why, no. I've had 60 years of immaculate health and some people don't even get a day. I've had 40 years of a marvelous marriage and ministry and some people never know that. She talked about her children, her grandchildren, her families, the meaning in her life. She said, should I be angry that all that lasted 60 years and not 70 or 80? Well, that would be ungrateful and I won't be ungrateful. It didn't surprise me that that was her attitude. What surprised me is that I'd already had those same thoughts. God had, had taken the darkness from me, taken the self-centered darkness from me, and allowed me to realize that I was a recipient of more blessings than I ever could expect to receive. That, that he owed me nothing more than what he had given me. In fact, he'd given me an embarrassment of riches, an embarrassment of riches that God didn't own me better. And so I gave him glory for that. You see, I don't know what it is for you, but most of us have an area of darkness in our lives where we are blind spiritually. My prayer for you is that the Holy Spirit will awaken you, if he hasn't already, to that area of blindness in your own life. And that he will perform for you the same miracle he did for the man born blind, the same miracle he was willing to perform for the Pharisees, the same miracle he's performed for me in some areas in my life, that he will give you sight. He will turn your darkness into light, your night into day, your doubt and your anger into joy. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for this story. We thank you for the contrast of darkness and light. And we thank you, Lord, that you're the God who heals spiritually, physically, relationally, financially, emotionally, mentally. You heal. And we claim that healing today, Lord, for we do it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Good night. God bless. Take care. We ran late tonight, didn't we? And I talked a long time. I apologize for that. Take care. Good night. <laughs>